All right. Everybody hear me okay? Sounds a little loud to myself. Am I too loud? Always. I was asking everybody about you. I'm just kidding. Oh, all right. Man, it's good to see everybody. Starting to get a little feedback. Yeah, everybody took the day off, man. What's up? But uh, some of you remember whenever I introduced Nicholas. And right next to him, though, is Tyler. Some of you might know Tyler. If you don't, raise your hand. There you go, Tyler. Um, It's good to have my daughter's boyfriends in church. I don't know if they're... What? Jack, have I not... um, like in, embarrassed you in front of everybody yet? Jack is right next to Tyler as well. I won't make either of them stand up today, um, but maybe later. But it is nice to have their boyfriends in here. I don't know if they're here um, because they're afraid that, you know, maybe maybe they they should be here and or whatnot, but it's good to have them here anyway. The title of the message this morning is, I Do. And one of my favorite topics to talk about is marriage. Because it's so important, not just to me, not just in my relationship, but it's important to God, it's important to the world. Uh, Maybe crank down the mains just a little bit. Um, And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. I think that that all of us, if you've been in a relationship with anybody, not just a man and a woman relationship, boy, girl, whatever, um, but even just person-to-person relationship, if if you've been in a relationship with them for more than a week, you know, you've probably had some sort of disagreements. You've probably had things that you've had to overcome, things that you've gone through, all these things. But these things, they they sharpen us. They, They make our friendships, our bonds better because we learn how to work through things. And um, my wife and I, that's definitely, we aren't the exception. You know, we've definitely had to work through things. Um, She's had to probably struggle working through things more than me <laughs> but because uh, uh, she definitely got the the raw end of the stick there but anyhow we, we will talk about relationships today and I hope that by the end of it um, God has used this opportunity to help you grow help you develop and maybe see things Uh, from a little bit different perspective. That's what I'd like to accomplish today. But before we get into it, I just want to uh, to pray uh, over all of us. So, Heavenly Father, good morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is with us, that you don't leave us, you don't forsake us, Lord. I pray that you will prepare our, our hearts to receive from you what you want us to receive today, God. We love you. We praise your holy name. Amen. Before we get into this too much, I was reading a book this week, and I guess in the late 1800s, over in England, they had pew rents, like seat rents, like you'd have to rent your your space at church. I was like, what in the world? Are you serious? Have you guys ever heard of that before? Has anybody ever heard of that before? Don't worry, we're not going to initiate that here. I just thought, man, that is so weird. That's crazy. But anyhow, yeah, that, that's so wild. So I want you guys to think about water, actual water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. It takes 
two totally different atoms to come together and create something that's extremely useful, beneficial, powerful, and life-giving. But it's always, it's always just surprised me, you know, that God can take two totally different things, combine them, and then they make something different. To make water, God joins atoms together to form molecules. A water molecule has three atoms. There's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That's why water is sometimes referred to as H2O, obviously. And a single drop of water contains billions of water molecules. So as, as we talk more about water, I'm going to get into it a little bit deeper. I want you to think of those things as a relationship. As a relationship, okay? Water together, whenever you have the hydrogen and oxygen, it can produce something that's extremely powerful. Think about the ocean. Think about pictures that you've seen. Think about videos that you've seen where the waves are just crashing into the shores, and, and it's, it's unstoppable. There are things that, that, um, that boats will go out and, and huge ships sink. Huge ships. I mean, you look at them, and they're like several stories tall. But then whenever you go out, does anybody remember the first time they went to the ocean? And you look out at it, and it's just, it's mind-boggling. It's just so vast. It's so huge. You've never seen anything like it. You know, even looking into the sky, that's, that's absolutely incredible. But it's looking into the sky to me almost seems not tangible. You know, like, it's, it's hard to kind of comprehend, you know. Then you look out at the ocean, and all this water, and it's right there, yet it's so ginormous. I will tell you, one of the most, the times I felt the most insignificant in my entire life was being at the ocean. And I was in Hawaii with my wife. We were renewing our vows um, for our 10-year wedding anniversary. And we went out to this beach called Tunnels Beach. And I'm swimming out there and snorkeling, and I, I see all the reefs, and it's called tunnels because these lava uh, tubes go way down there. But then I, I'm swimming, and I, I turn, and I look out, and I'm totally underwater, and everything was beautiful here. I've got reef and everything right here, but then I turn and look, and literally just like this drop off here, but it just went, and out there was into deep, dark nothingness, and I went, Whew. I mean, like, all of a sudden I realized I'm, I'm no longer a predator in any shape or form. I am, I'm definitely the prey here. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So, it takes a lot to scare me, but that scared things out of me. If you think about water, It's, if you just take a drop of water, it's just, li it's just little and wet, you know? That there's nothing really to it. No big deal. It's just a drop of water. But water carves canyons. Water sunk the Titanic. If you think about it, that's crazy. It killed every single human being on the planet except for Noah and his family on the ark. Every single human being on the planet, God used water to take them out. Yet it makes up the vast majority of our bodies, and without it, we can't live. Without it, we can't live. So keep this in mind. Keep the relationship aspect in mind as we're talking about this. When I was praying and asking God, God, what do you want me to what do you want me to bring? And I always want to teach on a couple things. I always want to teach on Jesus and his love and his his um, devotion to us, his selflessness his, and all that because it's it's awesome. The Holy Spirit because there's nothing cooler in the whole wide world. And 
marriage relationships because God is, he does so much with it. And I, I haven't been able to teach on relationship yet because it's just, it's so important to me to, to relay it to you guys in a way that, that you will receive it, in a way that you will be able to benefit from it, in a way that it will change your life. I want to be able to present it in a way that you guys will, will view it from a whole different perspective, you know? And, and even today, I, I don't know. I'm hoping and praying that it will come across that way, but I don't know that it will. I hope that it will. So think about water. We drink it, we wash with it, we swim in it. Jesus walked on it, so did Peter for a little bit. We eat fish from it. We water our plants with it, watch our kids play in it, travel over it, use it to move commerce. The military uses it to conceal submarines and other weapons. We put fire out with it. And the list just goes on and on and on. If you think about all the things that water accomplishes, and it's a couple things that God brought together. It comes in three very distinct forms. A solid, a liquid, and a gas. So it's interesting, this number three always keeps popping out at me as, as he was telling me this stuff. He said it takes, it takes multiple things to make this one thing, and, and I love doing that. And I'm like, that's sweet. That's awesome. Okay. So we've got a solid, a liquid, and a gas. The two hydrogens, the one oxygen. Those two hydrogens are kind of like a man and a woman, and the oxygen is kind of like God. To have a successful relationship you have to have all three of those things. You have to. If you don't, it will not work. Try drinking just two hydrogens, right? Has anybody in here ever taken a drink of water and then choked on it and you're like, <coughs> well, some smart Alex might say you can't breathe it. Like, it has one oxygen, but it also has two hydrogens. You can't breathe it, you know? And so, if you think about the three again, we've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And together they're one. But they're different, just like hydrogen and oxygen. In this relationship of a man and a woman with God, you've got two humans, and you've got God. It all comes together. These atoms make up a molecule. Well, as I'm looking at that, my mind automatically goes to the first Adam, which was mankind. And God, the Father, God, is in the council of the gods. And he says, let us make man in our image. And so, he went and made man in his own image. But at first, it was one. It was Adam. It was a man. But this man had every attribute of God because he said, let us make him in our image and in our likeness. So think about this. He didn't have all of the... the I don't know if he had all the physical characteristics of a man and a woman, but what I do know is that it was all together one. Think about the differences in men versus women. I mean, other than the fact that we all have arms and legs and a head and we walk upright, that's about it, right? I mean, that's, that's about the only thing that's similar. I don't mean to be rude or, or, you know, whatever. I'm just saying, men are totally different than women. And all of those differences were combined into one human. And as Adam's looking around, he says, the horse 
has a male and a female horse, you know, the dog, the birds, like everything has this male and female, but, but I'm just me. Even you, God, you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like, but I'm just me. Isn't it just like us to not be content? I think that was probably um, more of the man side coming out there. But he says, what, what about me? I want, I want somebody else. And then God said, okay. Put him to sleep. I don't know if he was like, pop, you know. <laughs> Put him, knocked him out a little bit. Um, he goes to sleep. And God takes a rib from him. A rib? Isn't that an interesting choice? Takes a rib to make, to make this woman. And you think, why a rib? That seems so insignificant. But then God takes something that's so insignificant and makes something so much better than he could even possibly, Adam could even wrap his mind around. He's like, whoa, man. And so that's why he named women, women. Whoa, man. That's for you, Kyrie. That's a dad joke. But then the man, man didn't stay the same. Adam wasn't the same after that. He was not the same after that. He didn't have the characteristics of the woman because God didn't just take a rib. He took the characteristics from the woman and put into him and put into a woman, into Eve. Thank goodness. But if you ever wonder, why are we so stinking different? It's because God had a purpose for that. So if he takes the characteristics out of Adam and puts them into Eve, if I'm, if I'm just me, if I'm just Nathan, I'm not complete. I'm still made in his image and in his likeness. I look like him and I am like him, but I'm not totally like him. I'm only a part like him. And if you guys know me and you know Brittany... I'm just a little part like him. She's a lot part like him. So I, I love how he takes the atom and combines these different atoms to make this molecule, to make water, to make something totally different. Separate, they're, they're totally different. He puts them together, they make water. It's so cool, and water can do so many things. He takes man... And he puts all these atoms together and molecules and cells and all this stuff. Makes man, makes a woman. And even those two things are totally different. But then he puts them together and they create something amazing. But they still aren't complete until they ask God to be the Lord of this relationship. To rule them, over them. To guide them, direct them. Without him, they just screw things up. You know how I know? Because <laughs> I've screwed a lot of stuff up. I think this stuff is really neat. So I wanted to look at like some biblical references for water. And obviously there's, there's so much in the Bible about water. The very first miracle that God ever, that Jesus did that we know of that's documented is he turns water into wine. Isn't that neat? Turns water into wine. It was probably just that nasty water that people were dipping their hands in to clean their hands as they come in. You know, we won't get too far into it. But also, Moses splits the Red Sea, splits water. Water is obedient to the command of God. Moses was obedient, and God split the Red Sea. He did that a couple times with Elijah and Elisha and stuff like that, but that's super neat. But Jesus, whenever he's, this is one of the coolest stories ever. When he's walking around with his disciples, and he goes to, um, he's, he's on his way to one place, and he goes through Samaria, which the Jews weren't, they weren't really welcome in Samaria. They didn't really have a great relationship. They kind of destroyed those relationships over the years. But Jesus says, we're going to go through Samaria. And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? 
That's not even the most direct route. Like, come on, man. Like, why, why would we go this way? Well, he goes, and he goes to this well. It's Jacob's well, and this well still exists today. They built this ridiculous-looking church over it, but it still exists today. You can literally go see this well, supposedly. Jesus is sitting there, and in John 4, 10 through 14, 9 through 15, roughly, I'm going to kind of paraphrase some of it, but Jesus he goes, he sends his disciples into the, into the town to get supplies, get food, all this stuff, and he stays back at the well. Because who knows that Jesus knows everything, right? He knows that he's going to be meeting somebody there that day. And a woman is there. She comes in the sixth hour of the day, not with all the other women, because she can't come with all the other women, because she's a prostitute, basically. I mean, she's, she sleeps around. She's had multiple husbands. She shows up. And Jesus asked her to get him some water from the well. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? First of all, if she was a Samaritan man, it would be bad enough. But a woman, a man, a Jewish man talking to a woman all by himself, that's kind of a no-no. Jesus did a lot of kind of no-no's. Um, according to culture. And so she's asking him, how is it that you're asking me for a drink? Like, this is, this is way outside the norm, way outside the norm. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know, I get it. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, this woman says. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? It's not sinking in yet. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and their livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. It does quench their thirst, but they will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus himself chose to use water as an example of everlasting life. of everlasting life. And he says that he is that. He gives that water. He gives it because it does quench thirst. On the cross, Jesus is dying, and they wanted to speed this process up. So they were going to go through and break all the legs of the, the three men that are up on the cross, the two thieves and whatever else they were, and, uh, and Jesus. But Jesus was so badly beaten that he had already cried out and given up his, his spirit. So whenever they walk up there, they're getting ready to break his legs, but in order to fulfill Scripture that none of his bones would have been broken, they didn't, they didn't know that they were fulfilling Scripture, but they didn't break his legs. The, the soldier took a spear, jabs it up in his side, up under his ribs, and John 19, 34 says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Blood and water flowed out of him. That was one of the, the signs that they knew that he had died. So in order to... To make water, you have to have the right amount of both things. You can't have three hydrogens and one oxygen. You can't have one hydrogen and two oxygens. You have to have two hydrogens and one oxygen. And those together make the water molecule. Keep that in mind as we go through. As we think of the relationship, it's it can only be brought into, into perfect 
a, a perfect relationship when you have a man and a woman and God present. You have to have those things. You can't have more of one than the other. It must be those things. And God did that for a reason, just like he made water for a reason. He put those things together for a very specific reason. I'm going to get into that a little bit. He does this as an example to the world. He wants the relationship that he made between a man and a woman and him, he made this relationship to show the world that he loves us. You might be like, well, what the heck are you talking about, Nathan? What? what? How's that show the world that he loves us? Well, he uses multiple things in the Bible to be an example for us. So God, he uses different ways to talk to us, right? Um, back in the Old Testament, he would use the prophets to go tell my people this. Some of them he would say, hey, go do this as an example. He told one to go buy a brand new belt. Don't let it touch the ground, put it on, you know, wear it around, and then take it out to the desert and bury it and leave it for like a year or two years or something crazy, and then go get it and bring it back. Now put it on, and it's like falling apart. And he says, now tell my people that this is what I'm going to do to them. And like, what? That's the weirdest example ever, you know? But it got the point across. He also made one lay on his side for a year and, and cook things out of uh, using dung as as the coal to, to burn stuff on and, and eat from that. It's like, what? That is so gross. Like, what in the world are you doing, God? And who can lay on their side for a year? I mean, goodness sakes, this is nuts. But in a relationship, to get back to relationship, who here has heard of Hosea and Gomer? Now, this is a little odd. Hosea truly is one of God's prophets, Hears from God. God asks him, what do you see? And he tells him and all this stuff. And then he says, all right, great. So you hear me. Good. You hear me? I've confirmed it. I want you to go marry a hooker. And he's like, huh? <laughs> what, what are you talking about, God? What are, you, what are we doing here? He says, go marry a hooker. So Hosea goes and marries a hooker. God is going to use this to prove a point. He uses it by saying, now go tell my people that this is what they've done. So Hosea represented God, and the hooker represented them and their unfaithfulness. They're sleeping around and, and loving other idols and worshiping idols and bowing down to these things that they carve out of wood and stone and stuff. And it makes God mad. And he uses that to prove a point. This is what you're like. You're defiling my relationship with you. This covenant with you, you're defiling it by loving other things that I didn't tell you to love. Hosea was obedient, which I love that he was obedient because you know he didn't want to. Well, then he falls in love with her. God tells him to have a kid. So he has a kid with her. He tells him, name it, whatever. I don't remember. He had three kids. Name them all these things that pointed out to the nation of Israel that, that God was coming against them. That God was turning his hand from them, his face from them. That he was no longer going to be in relationship with them. And then Gomer leaves him and goes back to being a hooker. When she was married to him and he was taking care of her and he loved her, she left him. You see how God used that to, to prove a point? This is you, Israel. You've fallen away. And then God tells him, go get her back. What? Are you kidding me? Go get her back. She left me, God. He's like, yeah, I know. That's why I told you to pick her in the first place because I knew she was going to do that. 
I'm proving a point here, Hosea. Go get her. And he's like, okay. So he goes and gets her because that's who God is. Isn't that our Father? Isn't that our wonderful, awesome Father? That He loves us so much that He not only goes and gets us back, but He proves the point. This is how much I love you. I know you're going to fall away. I know you're going to do stupid, bad things. I get it. I'm still coming after you. And he went and still got her back. That's amazing. I love how he uses that as an example for a relationship. He uses tons of different relationships in the Word. I think about Mary and Joseph. You know, here's the sweet little virgin Mary, and she gets pregnant before she was married. And uh, God lets Joseph know, hey, that, it's okay, that was me. That was me. <laughs> you should be okay with this. And so he is, and Joseph is a great husband. He gives us a great example of how to treat a woman properly with love and respect. He's a great example here. If you're single, that's okay too. Um, this does lean more toward the married people or people that are in relationship, that are going to get married, that want to get married, whatever. But Paul's take on marriage, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he wasn't, he wasn't real big on marriage. Like he... He literally said in 1 Corinthians 7, um, 8 and 9, he says, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, I think he's talking to men here mostly, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. Because when you burn with passion, outside of marriage, you're going to do things outside of the, the will of God, outside of His plan, outside of His purposes. We know that God has a perfect plan for us, and it's to prosper us and not to harm us. It's to give us a hope and a future, and if He has these purposes and these plans in mind for us, and that that His will will accomplish these good things to give us a hope and a future and not to harm us, then His path, His way, His direction is what's right for us. Even when it's super, super hard. Even when it's really difficult. I love that, that God knows that, that we're going to mess up, though. But we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can and that's in every area. I'm not just talking about areas of lust. I'm talking about every area of marriage. Like um, not being, not demanding your own way. Not demanding that things be done the way that you want them done. Because you think that you know what's right. Because you know what's best. In fact, God tells us to do the exact opposite. To put the other person first. Some people feel that, that because of, of Paul's passage there where he's talking about that if you don't have to marry, then don't. That they think that um, people shouldn't marry. That people should, should just abstain from getting married. That everybody should just, um, just not. Well... That's not God's will. It's not His purpose. He said to be fruitful and multiply. That's pretty easy to do, isn't it? <laughs> if you break it down, it's pretty easy to do. And He wants us to be in this relationship together because it's a clear picture of His love for us. The man and the woman, infatuated with each other, loving each other's you know, is a clear picture of our relationship with him. But I want to touch on the husband's role for a minute. If, 
if any of you have heard messages on marriage, then you've, you've definitely heard the message that, um, that a, a man should love his wife and a, husband should, uh, and a woman should honor and respect her husband. And it's crazy how many people take this thing out of context. Like they'll skip over that a man should love his wife just like Jesus loved the church and laid himself down, gave himself up, gave up his life. He died for us. That's not selfish. That's selfless completely. But sometimes certain guys will say, well, she should honor me. She's supposed to respect me. She's supposed to be this. She's supposed to be this. She's supposed to be this. See, the word says it. She's supposed to be this. If it were up to me, guys would not read that part at all, what the women should do. I may step on some toes. If I do, uh, please be Christ-like and forgive me. Um, But if it were up to me, guys would not read what the women should do. The only reason that a guy needs to know what the woman should do is because the guy has to do that first. The guy has to do that first. The man has to be that to God first. The man wants to lead the relationship. Well, that's how you lead. By doing exactly what the Bible says the woman should do for him, That's exactly what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to model that with his relationship to God first. If he says, well, she's not this, this, and this, he's the reason why. It's his fault. And I know, I know you're like, well, what if she grew up in a a broken home? What if she this? What if she this? What if she this? Then you're taking God out of the equation and you're focusing on that too much. It's not up to her. She's not going to be the one that makes those changes in her life. God's going to be the one that makes those changes in her life when she sees you treating him the way that she's supposed to treat you. That's just the simple fact of the matter. If you want her to change, be the change. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. We have to take up that role. And then the word says that we should deny ourselves, us men. We should deny ourselves. We should die to us for her. We should put her needs, her wants, her desires before our own, which means dying to ourselves, putting ourselves on the cross, and putting her first, doing whatever it takes to give her everything that she needs, wants, and desires. First, not she should do this for me and then I'll do this for her. No, 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 no. No, that's never the case. It's never the case. Not now, not ever. It's not, it won't be the case because that's not the way God designed it. God put this role and responsibility on our shoulders, men, to stand up and be men. That's why. And he was our example. He said, follow me. Do this. Do what I do. It's perfectly clear. It's laid out in Scripture everywhere. The role of that whole relationship, the responsibility of that whole relationship, if she does something... That, that you don't like, that's still your responsibility. It's your responsibility. If you want her to treat you better, then you dang well better treat her better. Or it's not going to happen, and you can't expect it to happen. Don't expect it to happen. Because that's not the way it works. We are to model exactly Exactly 
what we want them to be. The wife's role is to honor and respect her husband. Why is it important? Why is it so desperately important that I treat my wife the way God treats us? Why is it so desperately important that she treats me the way we're supposed to treat God? Why is that so important? There's a couple reasons. For the selfish reason of because that's what's going to make our relationship the greatest. When I give her what she wants, needs, and desires, she gives me what I want, need, and desire, and that's just the way, that's, that's relationship, man. And the longer you do it, the better it gets. It's just the way it is. We have a better relationship now than we ever have in our entire lives because we're learning to do this. And do I get it right all the time? Heck no, of course not. Probably won't until Jesus comes back, but hopefully I do. Hopefully I do, you know. But that's the selfish reason, right? Because we want life to be easy. If you want life to be easy, you just follow these simple steps. If you want relationship to be easy, you follow these simple steps. You pray for her. Daily, you pray for her. You daily pray for yourself that God will make you better. But... There's a much greater role and responsibility here. There's a much greater reason why I should treat her like God treats us, and she should treat me like we should treat him, and that's so that the world can see what a relationship between a Christian and their Father God in heaven is supposed to be like. I know dudes are like, I'm supposed to be a bride? I can't be a bride. I'm a guy. I'm too masculine for that. You're missing it. You're totally missing it. Whenever they asked the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they asked Jesus, they said, let me ask you something, Jesus. Let's say this man has this wife and then the man dies. And the law says that his brother should marry her to keep that family name going. Well, then he dies. And then somebody else, the the next brother in line, there's seven brothers, and she's the wife of all these brothers. Whose wife is she going to be when when they get to heaven? And Jesus says, it's nothing like that. You're going to be like the angels when you get to heaven. You're going to be married to me when you get to heaven. You're not going to be married to each other. You're going to know each other. You're going to love each other, all that stuff. But you're not going to be, it's not like that. You're going to be married to me. I made you for me. That's why I made you. You get to be with your spouse because I love you. And I want you to have a good time while you're on earth. I want you to make more people in my image and in my my likeness so that I can have a relationship with them. And that's what it takes. But when you get to heaven, stop thinking about that. Don't even worry about it. We have to understand that Our relationship with God in heaven is going to be so incredibly amazing. He, we are his bride. We are his church. We are his bride. And think about men, think about your wives. Or if you you aren't married yet, try to think about what it would be like if you were married. You found the woman of your dreams. She's better than any other human being on the planet because she is, my wife is to me. She better not be to any of you guys, but she is to me. Your wife is, is better than any other human being on the planet. You love her so much. You want her to have the best of everything because she deserves it, because you love her. So you want her to give her everything. God wants to give us everything. He says that I go away to prepare a place for you. He's going to make a place for his bride. We are his bride. Okay, so whenever the world looks at Brittany and I, they should be able to say, wow, Nathan really loves her. Nathan wants 
her to have everything. Like there's nothing Nathan doesn't give her. He spoils her. Like he, he lavishes things on her. He treats her with kindness and love and respect. Opens the door for her, you know. Makes the bed for her, makes coffee for her, what, whatever. He does all these things, you know, because he loves her so much. And then if they come and ask me, Nathan, why do you treat your wife like that? Why, why are you still doing that? You know, I had somebody ask me one time. They saw me open the door for my wife, open her car door, because I go and I open her car door 90-some percent of the time. You three? A hundred percent of the time. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, they're like, what, are you trying to make me look bad? I said, this has nothing to do with you. This has to do with me loving my wife. If you feel like you look bad, then start opening the door for your wife. Treat her like she's supposed to be treated. It's just like that, you know? That's how God treats us. That's what God wants to do for us. In a marriage relationship, we enter into a covenant. It's a covenant. You know, it's not a contract that can be broken. It's a covenant. And the nation of Israel, they had broken their covenant with God. And it broke God's heart. He was not happy about it. The hard, bad things that they had to go through, that they had to suffer through, God clearly said that he was doing those things to bring them back to himself. That, that those hard things that they had to go through were discipline to bring them back to him because he's the only one that can take care of them. He's the only one that can protect them, watch over them, love them. That they could put all their hope, faith, and trust in, in these other gods. And it wouldn't, it's not right. It's not going to happen. God says this marriage relationship, this covenant between me and you, between Brittany and I, it, it's supposed to represent our covenant relationship with God. That it can't be broken. That's why we said, till death do you part. That's why she almost killed me a couple times. <laughs> she didn't really almost kill me. I mean, it was close, but no, I'm just kidding. It's supposed to be a real and honest commitment. A real and honest commitment. There are a lot of people, we have great friends that have just lived together forever, you know, never took the step, never, never went to, um, to make the actual commitment to one another. I don't know, maybe they're afraid of commitment. A lot of people say, well, it's a tax write-off. It's a financial reason. Well, then you're serving money and not God. You're, you're more concerned that that money is going to take care of you than God is going to take care of you. I don't mean to step on any toes, but if it hurts, it hurts. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to bring the truth. It's a real and honest commitment to one another. Be committed. Be committed. God's all in with us. He wants us to be all in with him. And this... This is why Satan is attacking the sacred union of marriage so hard. This is exactly why he's attacking it so hard. He attacks it with divorce. It's just an easy way out. It's what the children of Israel did. They basically divorced God. I've divorced God before. Fortunately, he took me back. We got remarried. But divorce, Satan wants to absolutely destroy the sanctity of marriage because it's that clear depiction of God with, up, with him, us with God, and him with us. It's a clear depiction. He's going to do everything that he can to destroy that. He wants to make us think that it's not worth being married. 
Have you ever heard the term, the old ball and chain? Makes me want to punch somebody right in the mouth. I know that's not very Christ-like, but he did fashion a whip with cords, and he did drive people out of the temple. He didn't do that because of making a statement like that, but I'm just saying, like, I maybe have some of those attributes in me too. Abortion, I know that's a huge hot topic right now, you know? It's very, very controversial. But it is a way for Satan to destroy things that are created in the image and the likeness of God, that God specifically created to have a relationship with him, and that is stealing from God. That's stealing from God. I don't view it any other way. I view it as murder and stealing. That's how I view it. Because there's a difference between killing and murder. There's a difference in taking someone's life in war or because they're trying to kill you or your family or some, some other innocent person. There's a huge difference between that and murder. And God clearly lays that out. In His Word, it clearly lays that out. What can be done, what can't be done, what should be done, what shouldn't be done, and what will happen to you if you go outside of that law. I do understand that there are times where, where if something happened and somebody had to make a choice to get an abortion, maybe they were um, raped, maybe they were, you know, some horrible thing happened, and that needed to be done. Okay, all right. I'm not, I'm not here to judge people on that either. I'm, I'm just not. But I'm, I am saying that God, he wants that, that baby. He wants that baby. But he also wants you. So if anybody has had to go through that, if anybody made that choice, the great news is that, that, that we serve a loving and forgiving God. That he doesn't want you to feel um, remorse. He doesn't want you to feel regret. He doesn't want you to feel torn and broken and ripped inside. He doesn't want that for you. If you made that choice and, and now you're like, why in the world did I do that? He will heal you. He will forgive you. He's the great physician. He's good at that. And he wants you to be rid of that. He, it, it, the word clearly says that he went to the cross to take our sin and our shame. Our sin and our shame. He doesn't want you to have to walk in it at all. He doesn't. He wants to take that hurt from you. Another way that Satan is attacking the sacred union of marriage so hard is through homosexual relationships. Just like it takes two hydrogens and one oxygen to make water, it takes a man and a woman, the seed and the sperm, to make another human. But if you have a man and a man or a woman and a woman, that's not possible. And that's just another way that Satan is removing humans from the equation, removing them from the equation. He wants to get them out of the way. Because we were created in the image and in the likeness of God for a purpose. And God said that we as humans are going to rule and reign with him. And Satan, that's the whole reason he got cast out of heaven. Because he wanted to rule and reign with him. And God said, no, that's not why I created you. And then he sees us come along looking like God, being like God, and God promises that we get to rule and reign with him? We get to judge the angels? Of course Satan's going to be mad about that. Of course he is. Of course he's going to try to lie to you and twist up your mind and make you think that the natural way that God created things is not right. It's not the only way, right? Because Satan loves to take a little tiny bit of the truth and twist it around to where it's no longer truth, but it still kind of sounds like the truth. It makes you feel like the truth. You want to do this. 
It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. You're going to like it. You should really do this. But it's just, it's like you're trying to hit this goal, but then just that little bit takes you and sets you about this far off. And you miss the goal. You miss it. You miss it because you compromise just a little bit. That's all he wants you to do is compromise just a little bit. Because then once you make that compromise, you're going to make, well, I can make this compromise over here. It's not that big of a deal. And then, well, I could, I could make this compromise over here. It's not that big of a deal. And before long, you don't care about God. And you prostituted yourself just like the nation of Israel. And he has to take something and put it right in your face to remind you, I love you. I created you for me. And you get to have me. And I get to have you. He's got to remind us of that. Pornography. It, it is this slippery slope. You know, it's absolutely wrong. It's sin. And once it gets into the marriage bed, it destroys it. It defiles it. The word says, if you look at another woman with lust in your eyes, then you've sinned. You've committed adultery. But yet, we want to put pornography in front of our face? What does that make you do? It makes you lust. What's Satan doing right now? You can't turn on TV. You can't open up social media. You can't go to the gas station and see a, a newspaper or a, a magazine sitting on the stand that doesn't have pornography on it. It destroys your relationships. It's like a poison. It's like literally like a disease that gets down inside you and it will eat you alive. So much so that then you just, you don't even care about the woman that God gave you, the man that God gave you. Because your mind, your eyes have been everywhere else. And it's like, well, she doesn't look like this. He doesn't look like this. He doesn't do this. She doesn't do this. What? No. She does what God designed her to do for you and you to do for her. Your eyes should never even see that crap in the first place. You should never even see it. It's a slippery slope. Selfishness is another thing that absolutely destroys a marriage. But what's crazy is right in the beginning of marriage, generally you're young, you know, and, and you just you meet this person that you're just absolutely infatuated with, and they could do nothing wrong ever, ever. And in, in their eyes, you could do nothing wrong. And then as time goes on, all of a sudden you realize, oh, they're a human being? I thought they were an angel. You, mine still is an angel. I don't know about you guys. But right there in the beginning, there's never a more selfish time, though. Even as much as you love them, even as much as you care about them, and you, you want to be with them, they're your everything. Guess what? You're still super selfish. And, and you come into the, the relationship thinking, I don't want them to change at all. I love them just the way they are. And then before long, you're going, I bet I can change them because they do this that I don't like. And I think they should probably do it this way because this is the way I like it. You know? Anybody? Anybody ever been there? <laughs> I know y'all have. Don't raise your hand. Don't nudge your spouse. And greed. Greed can come in and destroy your relationship. Destroy that covenant relationship because you want, you want more. You want more. You want more. You want more. If it's greed of, of financial gain, then you work harder. You work more. You work out of town. You work away from home. That's just a rep recipe for disaster. I've seen it time and time again. You know? There are so many things that Satan will use to destroy that sacred marriage, that sacred covenant. Thankfully, our God is a restorer of all things. He redeems all things. And all we have to do literally is say, Father, please forgive me. I've sinned. I've, I've stepped away from you. I've done things outside of your, your desire, your design. Please fix me. Please fix this. 
Humble yourself and pray. And he will heal your relationships. He'll heal your heart. He'll heal your mind. He will remove memories from your head. I've literally, I've asked him, God, please remove all memories of anybody other than my wife. And he's faithful. He's faithful to do that. So the title of the message was, I Do. And I want to encourage you guys, no matter where you are in your relationships with one another, if you're not in a relationship with somebody else, I want you to make that that declaration in your own heart, in your own mind, that I do. I do set myself apart for whatever it is that God has for me. Not things of this world, but whatever he has set apart for me. Say, I do to my relationship with my wife, with my husband, with my relationship with God. Say, I do. Walk it out. Proverbs 31 is such an amazing chapter. It talks about a woman and a good woman and what she does, you know, and how she, how she operates. I think that it's a great um, uh, goal for women. I think that it's great for men to read it and pray that God will give them the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding to help their wife be that and be whatever it takes for, for their wives, for their wives to be able to be that. Proverbs 31, it's outstanding. If anybody wants any prayer, we're going to be up here afterwards. I am going to pray for you before we leave. And uh, we've got at least one more worship song. Uh, So if you do want prayer, please feel free to come up. We'll pray for you. If you're watching online or something, you can always email or call the church. Um, And we also have a prayer chain here that that we can be praying for you. Um, You can reach out to me directly, and I'll help you with whatever it is that you want help with. So, I love you guys and gals, and uh, I hope that this just penetrated your heart today. So, let's pray real quick. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will help us to be the men and women that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that you will give us a new revelation and a clearer understanding of who you want us to be in relationships with one another and who you want us to be in relationship with you, God. Help us to seek your face above all things, above all of our own selfish wants and desires, our greed, our our, um, uh, human wants. Lord, I pray that, that you will be absolutely the most important thing in our lives to all of us, Lord. Help us to be that example that you want us to be to our spouses and to the world. Help us to remain in this covenant relationship with you, God, and to never fall out of it. Thank you for taking the steps first, for loving us first, for designing us and desiring us first. Thank you for being that example, God. We love you so much. We just pray all these things in your mighty son Jesus' name. Amen.